Okay, tonight we've come to number three in our series, The Dangers of Liberal Theology. Theological liberalism. Not a small thing. The stakes are high. The gospel is at stake. And tonight we'll see the honor of God is at stake. I don't know if any of y'all have read that classic book written in 1973 called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. I highly recommend it. And he says a couple of things at the beginning, one of which has stuck with me for all these years. He said that there was a man that was like at a party or at a, at a bar or something, and he had just been beating up another person. And he said, Why? well, he insulted my mother. And um, Packer said, shouldn't we want to stand up and fight when someone attacks our God? Doesn't mean we hit him with our fists. But we should have the courage of our convictions. The honor of God is at stake. So tonight we're looking at the liberal heresies concerning God Himself. First, a few words of introduction. Many, many years ago, I learned an important theological principle, and it's this. All errors in practice can be traced back to an erroneous view of God. Now, just think about that. I think it was Errol Hulse that taught me that around the year 1979. Some of you weren't even born then. But what does that mean? Well, when you th- here's an example. When you think of liberalism, you often think of their errors in practice. They believe in abortion, homosexuality, socialism. Uh, they tend to be pacifists and things like that. Well, those are practical errors, but they didn't arise out of a puff of smoke. They came from theological errors. And so in a way they're being consistent. And their theological errors come back to their erroneous views of God. And if you gave me enough time, I could show how you can link them one by one by one. Recently I had to deal with a friend of mine that is backed into hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism says we don't give the free offer of the gospel. And some of them say that non-Christians do not have the duty to savingly believe in Jesus. Well, that's a practical error. So I'm trying to show them. I said, no, no, no. You have an imbalanced view of God. You're overemphasizing His sovereignty and not balancing it with His love or His holiness or with human responsibility. And so his practical mistakes are rooted in an imbalanced view of the attributes of God. Those are two illustrations of what I mean. All errors in practice are traceable back to errors about God. Liberalism has many serious errors in ethics, but it's based upon a wrong view of God. So tonight we're going to cover, oh, again, about a dozen or so as we're doing each week. And um, there are more, but we're hitting the major ones. But again, I would remind you, not all theological liberals hold to all of these errors. Some do hold to most of these errors. But what you'll notice is a general pattern, a tendency in a certain direction. Some of these you may have heard about, and hopefully tonight I will give you uh, ammunition on how to handle them. But other ones may be new to you, and I'm not going to go into great depth, but we'll mention them, define them, explain them, and then refute them from the Scriptures. Because we have to do it by the Bible. As we concluded last week, it says in Isaiah 8.20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. Also, it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 that we know there is only one God, but it says many false gods. There is only one true God, but there are many false gods of not only false non-Christian religions, but of pseudo-Christianity. So what we're looking at tonight is, as it were, the false gods of liberalism. And they do not believe in the one true God. Or as Machen said, they have a different idea of the Bible. God, Christ, sin, salvation, life, ethics, life after death. How can you possibly say that's another form of true Christianity? So they worship a different God or gods, or in some cases, goddesses. Well, where do we start? Well, let's start with the basic thing about God, His existence. Now, you would think that liberals would assume that, saying, yes, there is a God. Hold on. Back in 1966, Thomas J. Altizer, a very, very liberal Baptist theologian teaching up in Upper State New York, wrote a book called The Gospel of Christian Atheism. Christian 
atheism. This was at the height of the controversy called the death of God. I'm old enough to remember Time magazine, I think it was 1966, had a big spread, a big ar- ar- a series of articles on it, but on the cover, it was all in black with big white letters, and it said, Is God dead? And because that was the big rage, this was a theological fad. God is dead. Altizer and um, Paul Van Buren, Gabriel Verhaney, and, and others who really made a name for themselves, kind of like Andy Warhol's, you know, 15 minutes of fame. And then they went the way of all other fads like the hula hoop. But this was a fad then. But uh, you say, where did that come from? What did they teach? It all really goes back to uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, a uh, German atheist philosopher whose father was actually a Lutheran pastor. But Nietzsche was famous then and is still being studied. I remember I had to read a little bit of him in philosophy class once. And uh, Nietzsche taught that God is dead. And that was his motto. There is no God. And it came out in one of his novels. Because there are some people who write philosophy. Other ones write philosophical novels. So in one of his novels, there's this madman comes running into the town and comes up to the town square and stands up there and makes a speech. And everybody says, oh, who's this crazy fool? And the man with his weird look in his eye keeps crying out, God is dead. God is dead. And they said, oh, go away, fool. You're, You're crazy. He says, God is dead. We killed him. And the churches are his tombs. And they begin to say, what are you really getting at? And he said, well, the idea of God is dead. There never was a real God, but the idea of God is still being promulgated. There is no God. And, of course, Nietzsche is saying the man really wasn't crazy. In a way, that was philosophical prophecy because Nietzsche ended the last ten years or so of his life insane, a raving lunatic locked up in a Swiss asylum. He couldn't live with his own philosophy, saying there is no God, God is dead. Well, there have been other atheists, but Nietzsche didn't particularly claim to be a Christian. Gradually, though, a form of atheism seeped into liberal theology. Because, as we are seeing in this series, where does liberalism come up with its nonsense? Borrowing from non-Christian philosophy. And so whatever is in vogue philosophically will eventually be borrowed by theological liberals, and so that's what they did. One of them, for example, was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Now, before I explain his, uh, uh, some of his errors, Bonhoeffer has uh, now become somewhat popular in evangelical circles. Why in the world would they want to make this guy a hero? The only thing good I can say about the guy is that he was, uh, he was a German that was part of a conspiracy to assassinate Adolf Hitler. He got caught, he got executed, but he's not a martyr for the faith. But that doesn't make him an evangelical. He was an out-and-out liberal. Now, he did write one interesting book, and he's famous for one quote there. The quote is, when Christ calls a man to come, he invites a person to come and die. Well, that's right. Pick up your cross and follow me. But the rest of his stuff is usually incomprehensible liberal mishmash. And one thing that he taught, and he didn't elaborate on, was he said, well, we should have religionless Christianity. Now, he wasn't saying we need less and less uh, ritual and tradition, and we need more true life and vigor. No, that's not what he's meaning. Somewhat similar to what um, Harvey Cox taught in the 1960s when he wrote a book called The Secular City, saying, well, there is such a thing as secular Christianity or religionless Christianity. You know, it's kind of this mishmash where you live it and you don't explain it to people and you don't have to push the gospel on people and stuff like that. Um, Anyway, let's get back to when it hit the, uh, its heyday, Altizer and these others said God is dead, but they meant different things. Altizer, for example, had this view that there once was a God, but when God became a man, he ceased being God. There's only Jesus. There's no God out there. There was the living Jesus, who is God in the flesh, and He opened the door by which we all become God. So he said, there's no God out there. We are God and you are God and that tree and and so forth is God. By the way, there's a pop song about a year later that I think was indirectly related to this. Uh, It was a pop song, uh, Suzanne, written by Leonard Cohen. And it says, Jesus was a sailor and he walked upon the water. And one day all men will be sailors, saying we will all be like Jesus. 
Well, this is the sort of uh, stuff you get in liberalism. That Yeah, well, maybe there was a God, but that's all changed. How do we refute this idea? By the way, the others said, no, there really is a God. And what they meant was, God is dead in social consciousness and in human relationships. They said, God is out there, but so far as the average person is concerned, He doesn't exist. Even when people say they believe in God, they live as if He doesn't exist. So for all practical purposes, God is dead. And then their solution was, well, we we rediscover Him and have a living relationship by existential such and such. Well, so on and so forth. How do we refute this? 1 Timothy 1.17 is one of several verses. It says, God is immortal. He is a source of life. He cannot die. So when God became a man, He didn't cease to be God. Jesus was the God-man. So God cannot die. So He did not die. And yet these other milder ones had a grain of truth. And I say only a grain, like one grain on a whole beach filled with millions of grains of sand. Titus 1.16 says, Quote, they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. So, the greater truth in that milder form of this is, yes, there is a God, but people live as if there is no God, so they live sinful lives. That much is true. But I would apply that verse to the liberals. They profess to know God. Let me read the verse again. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. In other words, their lives... So if they don't believe in God, really, they don't have a living relationship. Now you see what I meant by what I began with. All errors in practice are traced back to errors about God. So they, they profess to know some kind of God, even though they distort Him, but their very lives show they deny Him and they don't truly know Him. The rest of the verse says being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. So by their bad works, they don't have good works and they're abominable and disobedient. I can't think of much of a better description of Theological and ethical liberals. Let's move on. A couple of years ago, I did a long series of 55 messages on the uh, existence and attributes of God. Here are two of them. Transcendence and eminence. Uh, what do those mean? Basically, it means this. Transcendence, God is out there. Eminence means He is down here. He is infinite, but He is also near us. Or as it says in Acts 17, he is not far from any one of us. So the question then came up among some theologians a few hundred years ago. Well, he can't be both, so which is he? And so uh, one of them taught, yes, God is transcendent. He transcends his creation. He is out there. He is not in his creation. The creator is out there. This was one of the keynotes of the uh, heresy called deism, D-E-I-S-M. comes from the Latin word deus, which is the Latin word for God. And they would say, we believe in God, but of course God is out there. He created the world, but He's not involved in the world. He doesn't do miracles. He doesn't speak. There's no revelation. And we can't know Him. And so that error is still around today. Uh, They use two illustrations. One is that God is the great clockmaker. He makes the clock, He winds it, and He goes off. The universe is the clock. God does not intervene. But as J.I. Packer said, Even a clock needs winding from time to time. We'll put in a new battery. God keeps the clock going. Secondly, they use the illustration that he's the absentee landlord. He he leases out the universe. We're in the universe. He is not. And I keep saying he is not because they say God doesn't intervene. With revelation, that is, inspired word, the Bible. They say the Bible is good literature, maybe even good philosophy. But it's not revelation. These are the views of man explaining what's happening in nature. Uh, We know different. It is the word of the living God. It is revealed. But then secondly, they don't believe in special revelation of any kind. Now, you remember there are two kinds of revelation. Number one, natural revelation. God speaks in nature, somewhat indirectly. Romans 1 and uh, Psalm 19, one of the key places on that. Well, they may believe in a natural idea about God, but they don't want to call that revelation. But we also believe in special revelation. Special revelation is not just in nature. It is something supernatural. Miracles. The deists did not believe in miracles, and there are those today that do not believe in miracles, but yet they still believe in the, They say they believe in the God of the Bible. Their view is uh, such as, well, for example, they borrowed this idea from David Hume, an extremely 
liberal skeptic Scottish philosopher of the 1700s. And he said, by the very definition, miracles could not happen. And he said, um, I'm such a skeptic and I know that miracles cannot happen any more than two plus two can equal twenty six and a half. And he said, even if I saw a miracle, I wouldn't believe in it because it could be an hallucination. It could be uh, a trick played on me. Uh, it could be like an optical illusion. And he gave other explanations because he says miracles just cannot happen. Other ones that are more deistically inclined said that miracles could happen, but God won't do them because God, God is a gentleman. And for God to do a miracle, he would be breaking his own laws. They said, we believe in the laws of nature. Look at the very uh, preamble to the Declaration of Independence, for example, written by Thomas Jefferson, who is a deist, together with Ben Franklin, George Washington, and some of our founding fathers. That document says, of nature and of nature's God. So they said, yes, God is the God of nature, but he has put in certain scientific laws. Laws could, should not be broken, either by the citizens or by the lawgivers. This was a big debate at that time in the 1780s and 90s, the, the height of deism at that point. And they said God is a great lawgiver. But God should not break his own laws, therefore there are no miracles. That's a very clever ruse to get around the Bible. How do we answer that? Francis Schaeffer had a very succinct way of answering that. He said, since God exists, miracles are possible. And since God has spoken, he has told us he has given us miracles. God can do miracles. He has. You can't read hardly any book of the Bible without coming to that conclusion. Whatever happened to deism? Well, it reached its heyday and then it began to die out around the year 1800 as philosopher after philosopher were nailing in philosophical nails to the top of the deistic coffin. And they more or less had the funeral about that time. But there's an interesting development. It started mainly in France where the extreme de deists like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and some of the others, they said, God is out there. Yes. He's out there, way out there, so far out there, and he hadn't spoken, he doesn't intervene. How do we know he's out there? Extreme French deism became French atheism, and that's what started the French Revolution. That was the engine that drove the French Revolution. Let me also parenthetically say this, I might bring it up in a later message. Uh, that was a revolution, not only in France, and then a couple of years later over here in the United States, Actually, here before there, but it was the same idea of, of, of deists. And we want revolution and the rights of men and, and so on and so forth. But the driving engine was this reaction against historical biblical orthodoxy. In France, they were vehemently against not only the Catholic Church, but against the Protestants. They rounded them up and off with their heads. And uh, as deism was spreading, there was this anti-Christian sentiment, but something else. If you know a little bit about European history, this was the beginning of the revolutionary spirit. Um, Karl Marx, for example, when he developed this, he said a specter has come across the whole continent, haunting the, uh, the empty warehouses called churches, and that now there's a new specter. Well, that, that started something back then. It started the French Revolution. It affected the American Revolution. It later led to the Marxist Revolution in Russia and various other revolutions took their keynote basically from French deism hyphen atheism and the writings of those people there that saying we're throwing off the, the shackles of God and of Christians and uh, King Louis the Fourteenth and all these others. And so they became libertines and, um, and very dangerous. And so liberalism has always gone along with this revolutionary specter. I might get back to that later. Okay, so there's the idea of transcendence without the balance of eminence, and it led to atheism. Well, what about eminence? That's another word for God is near to us. He is here, not just out there, but He is near. Well, what happens with um, eminence? Well, Again, any imbalance in your view of the attributes of God will lead to a blasphemous, idolatrous view of God. And when deism was dying out, a new kind of um, 
philosophy and theology was taking root called idealism. You may have heard of Georg Friedrich Hegel. Um, he greatly influenced Karl Marx, for example. Marx was an out-and-out -out atheist. Hegel was an idealistic pantheist, saying God is um, unknowable, he is impersonal, everything is God, but he is this ideal. But because God is so near, he's not out there, he's here and in us. Now you say, well, that sounds a little philosophical. How would I bump into someone teaching that today that claims to be a Christian? Here's a little motto. Here's a little bit of God in each one of us. You ever heard that? They say, well, we're all part of God. And there's a spark of deity within each one of us. Let me give you a very concise, accurate definition of that. That is Christian Buddhism. Buddhism says... God is everything. There's a spark of deity within each one of us. And when we die, we become part of the all, which is the nothing. And it's like spitting into the ocean. And we absorb into the all, to the nothing. That's the eventual nirvana. You find a lot of that in theological idealism. Now, another form of this um, isn't just pantheism, but panentheism. What's the difference? Pantheism comes from two Greek words. Pan, meaning all, and theos, God. All is God. God is all. Uh, another kind of philosophy that influenced theological liberalism is called panentheism. All is in God. In other words, we are part of God, but there's still some of God outside the universe. This was an attempt to still maintain some kind of transcendence as well as, athe as, uh, well as eminence saying God is out there, but he's also down here. But of course, we are still part of God, but there are some parts of God that is not part of humanity. And when they say this, they think they are being profound. They are being profoundly wrong, as they are many times. Look it up in Romans 1. Uh, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. What's the truth? According to the Bible, God is both transcendent and eminent. We need to keep them both in balance. He is out there. He is down here. Equally, there is no place God is not. And yet, God is separate from His universe. The Creator is not the same as the creation. Again, Romans 1 condemns the people that are into idolatry. And idolatry always begins with the philosophical wrong idea of God. And it says they worship the creature rather than the Creator. God is different than His creation. He is to be worshipped, not His creation. Secondly, Acts 17, Paul came into Athens and he did theological battle with the Stoics who were pantheists that believed God is near. And he also dealt excuse me, with the Epicureans who basically believed God is out there and not personally knowable. And Paul basically rebuked both, excuse me, both of them. Okay, let's move on. Next, the personality of God. Obviously, if you believe in pantheism, you believe God is impersonal, although some try to make him give a personality to the all God. Now, two terms come to the surface on this. For example, the German liberal that came to America, Paul Tillich, uh, whose writings are almost incomprehensible, Nonsense. And I mean that literal. I'm not just stepping on his toes. It is nonsense. It is babble. Or as Shakespeare said, sound and fury signifying nothing. And yet people think, oh, this is deep. Oh, this is wonderful. No, it is nothing. Again, let me throw in an editorial. You read some of the liberals and it sounds profound because you can't understand it. Or like a person that walked out of a liberal church shaking his head said, must have been deep. I didn't understand a word of it. No, I like what old J. Vernon McGee said, who had an earned Ph.D. in theology, but could sound down to earth. He said, they sound deep when they're only muddy. Come out here, uh, you know, I can show you a mud puddle. You can't see the bottom, but it's only two inches deep. It's shallow, but it's muddy. He says, but I can take you up to a pool of water that if it's not muddy, you can see the bottom even if it's a hundred feet deep. And I thought that was a good illustration. Liberalism is a shallow puddle. And yet people think that it's deep because they do not understand it. Well, here are the two terms. Tillich said, God is not personal. He is, quote, the ground of being. 
Now, he's not saying God is the creator of everything that is and he's the only ultimate being as being of himself. He's not meaning that because he is intentionally rejecting the historical orthodox view of God. So he says he's this impersonal something, this ground of being, whatever that is. And that's kind of what he was saying. Whatever he, she, it, they is. Whatever is, is, is. Then there is Bishop John A.T. Robinson, and uh, in his book called Honest to God in 1963, he, uh, he said that God is basically ultimate reality. Now, there is a true sense in which God is the ultimate reality. He's the eternal one. That's not what Robinson meant. He meant, well, he's part of all reality, and he's like the tip of the mountain of everything else, and we were to climb that mountain and find the meaning of it. But basically, they were saying God is personally unknowable. Now, this developed out of the death of deism and this hodgepodge of idealism. The leading philosopher that probably killed off um, deism and the overemphasis on transcendence was the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who some say was a theologian, but he's really more of a philosopher. Why was he so revolutionary? He rejected most of the proofs of the existence of God, such as taught by the four ones taught by uh, Thomas Aquinas. He did uphold a form of the moral argument of God, saying, since there is morality, there must be a moral lawgiver. And so, you remember back what I said about ethics is based in theology. He says, since there is ethics, there has to be a God, because we can't let go of ethics or else everybody will kill each other. So in his uh, moral imperative... Uh, he said, well, there, there, there is a God, but he is unknowable. He is out there. And he said that between God, whoever he is, there is a curtain between him and us. And it's this impenetrable thing. And since God doesn't do miracles and God doesn't speak, spoken like a good deist, um, we know that he's there, but we can't know him. That is the personification of what Paul describes in Romans 1. He says that they know that there is a God, but they don't know Him personally. But we do. Let's refute that. John 17, 3, our Lord Jesus Christ was praying and said, this is eternal life, that they may know You, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom You have sent. It is possible to personally know God. If God is impersonal, persons cannot know Him. God is personal. We are personal. We can personally know know Him and have a living relationship with Him. Everybody knows that there is a God, but not everybody knows Him personally. Second Thessalonians 1.8 says that at the second coming, Jesus will execute vengeance on those that, quote, do not know God. And so these um, deists that say that they know that there is a God, but they do not know Him personally, they say He's beyond knowledge. They are, as it were, confessing that they do not know God. They are in the bullseye of God's vengeance at the second coming says that people that do not know God will be punished. Next, we know that God is personal. Personal pronouns are used about Him. He has personal names. He speaks, He feels, He thinks. He has the attributes of personality. But some liberals that want to say God is impersonal say, no, God is beyond personality. They think that it's degrading to say God is personal. No, they are wrong. God is more personal than we are he is not less personal than we are. The liberals of this stripe basically make him impersonal, less personal than we are. They almost make him like an animal or a rock. God is personal. How can I say he is more personal than we are? Each of us are persons. We have one person. C.J. God has three persons in one divine nature. So he is personal beyond what we are, but being personal... He can know us and we can know Him. Let's move on to the next error. The next one is called open theism or the openness of God. And again, it um, borrowed from the poisonous wells of philosophy. The philosophy it borrowed from was goes back basically to Alfred North Whitehead, who is a, um, uh, a professor of mathematics at Cambridge. And he was a founder of what was called process theology. Now, a form of that can be traced back to ancient Greek philosophy, and I needn't go into that. Uh, then uh, his disciple Charles Horchhorn, who lived well into his 90s, ended up teaching, I believe, at the University of Texas. And then John Cobb and other ones kind of made this a kind of theology. What is process theology? They say God is in the process 
of growing. He is, there is the being of God, and there is the becoming of God. He is in the process. He is growing. He is growing in knowledge and in being and these other things. Kind of like, you know, the, the, the cosmogony of the, uh, the Big Bang. The idea is that once upon a time there was nothing. And then there was this one little microscopic concentrated bit of uh, atomic energy and light. And then it exploded and it's growing. The universe is expanding. They say, even so with God. Some would say once, at one time there was no God. And then zap, something called God. But usually they'll say, well, he's like some eternally concentrated something that we might call God. But then for some reason we don't fully understand, he began to explode and he is in the process of expanding. That's a very rough summary of process theology. How did that come into theology? Well, sadly to say, it started infecting some that had claimed to be before this, even evangelicals. Up until, oh, let's say about 1980, evangelicals saw through this and said, that's not the true God. God is, per- is, is perfect and he doesn't grow, he, he knows everything, etc. But there are some uh, hitherto pretended evangelicals that dipped their cups into this uh, sordid swamp and they came up with what they thought was an evangelical view and it came out as open theism. What is that? Well, it's taught by Clark Pennock. John Sanders, uh, Nathan Rice, uh, uh, Boyd, and other ones. And basically what they said is, yes, God is growing in knowledge. They They said God does not know everything. God does not know the future. The future is open. And therefore, this is what makes this exciting. Some call this risk theology. God takes risks. Which is another way of saying, well, when God prophesies, he's guessing. Kind of like a gambler saying, well, I hope it comes up, you know, 7-Eleven. Hey, and I can win. Oh, this makes it exciting, bold, daring. Nonsense. And so they say God does not know the future, and therefore we are absolutely free, and God is absolutely free. Well, there are a number of books written against this uh, dangerous heresy, and it is heresy. And these people were not evangelicals. They were just simply liberals of another variety, and they went into deeper liberalism. It became a debate in the Evangelical Theological Society a few years ago, and sad to say, many of those members of the Evangelical Theological Society said a person can believe in the open theism and still be considered an evangelical. There should have been a walkout. They should have burnt down the Evangelical Theological Society. Uh, Roger Nicole and before him uh, John Gerstner said, if we believe this, we've got no right to call ourselves evangelical. The term means nothing at all. So they were saying God does not know the future. He has limited omniscience, but he is learning and he is guessing. Some of them even went so bold as to say God guesses and makes mistakes. One of them in one of his books said, well, God made a mistake when he flooded the earth. That's why it meant when it said, well, God repented that he had made man. Just like we repent when we have a sin. They are now saying God made moral mistakes. That's accusing God of sin. In addition to being poisoned by process theology, it's also traceable back to Socinianism, which we mentioned in our first lesson, the liberals of the Reformation era. How much have they read of the Socinians? I don't know. They seem to have been influenced more directly by the process philosophers. But again, these Pennock, Sanders, and the other ones were extreme Arminians. And as I said briefly a few weeks ago, the extreme early Arminians were influenced by the Socinians. Extreme Arminianism can lead to open theism and out-and-out liberalism. That's one reason why Calvinism is a good anchor and defense against liberalism. Well, one of the best ways to, uh, to refute open theism is, is this. God is perfect. Perfection cannot grow. If it grows, that meant it was imperfect before. He is not in the process of going from being to becoming. He is already perfect in being. Next, he is immutable. Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. He is not in the process of changing. James 1.17 and many other verses teaches his immutability, his unchangeableness. Next, we're told that he is perfect in knowledge. Psalm 147.5, he knows everything, past, present, and future. And you find this especially in the middle chapters of the book of Isaiah. One of those sections that liberals like to say, it wasn't written by Isaiah. 
Time and time again in these chapters, from chapter 40 to oh, about chapter 50, God thunders against the idols and says, they have eyes, they don't see, they have lips, they don't speak. They are not like me. They are chunks of wood. I am the true God. And over and over again, He says, I am the one and only God. And He proves it. As it were, He layers His reputation on the line by saying, I can prove that I'm God. I predict the future. Those idols cannot do that. Let them bring forth their prophecies. They can't even tell you about tomorrow's weather. God boasts about His deity saying, I know the future. But open theism says God does not know the future. They have taken a first step into openness atheism. Let's move on. Another wrong idea of God has been very popular with liberals for oh, 200 years ago, uh, 200 years or so. It's called the universal fatherhood of God. And they say God is everybody's father. We're all His children. Brotherhood of man. God is everybody's father. This is so common amongst theological liberals. They'll blink like a little girl naively. But God is everybody's father. We're all children of God. Group hug. We're all the family of God. Doesn't matter what you believe. If you are a person, God is your father. They're wrong. The small grain of truth in this is two or three verses in the Bible, such as Acts 17:28 that indicates that God is the creator of all people, just like a father is involved in the creation of his offspring. It says here, we're the offspring of God. Uh, Hebrews 12.9 says he is the father of spirits, in the sense that he is creator. However, the Bible usually retur- reserves the term father regarding God, not to creation or procreation, but to a relationship. Because as anybody knows, a man can procreate and not be a true father to that child. He can abandon him, put him up for adoption or something like that. So God is a creator, but he also has to have that relationship. And people are born without that relationship. So God is not their father in this sense. And we are born sinners. Well, to be more precise, we have a father, but it's not God. John 8.44, Jesus said to his opponents who were very religious, he said to them, you are of your father, the devil. You have his nature, you you have his will, you you do whatever he wants you to do. He's a liar, you're liars. He's a murderer, you're murderers. And that applies to all human beings. God created us, but we have the nature and the inclination of the devil. So we have to become, become children of God before we can pray our father who art in heaven, whereas John Gerstner said, until we become God's children by regeneration and adoption, our prayer should be directed not up but down, our Father which art in hell. And Gerstner was right. So these that believe in the universal hood of God show thereby they tipping their hand, they are still of their father, the devil. And they are remaking God in his image. More on that later. Now, here's another extremely popular error concerning God that the liberals promulgate. They say God is love. By the way, that's a, word, a term found twice in the Bible, First John 4, 8, and 16. And they say love is the main attribute of God or even the only attribute of God. And they feel nice and smug in that, thinking God is love, God is love. And you'll find that over and over and over again. It's behind their rejection of hell, for example. Their rejection of the wrath of God and so forth. Love, 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 that's all God is. Or that's just what God is. Or His main attribute and so forth. And so it comes up over and over and over again. That's what they believe God is love. Well, God is love. How do we refute this then? Because God is love. First John 4, 8 says God is love. But First John 1, 5 says God is light. In other words, God is holiness. He is both. And those that overemphasize love de-emphasize holiness. We need to keep the attributes of God in perfect, infinite balance. Liberals don't. So when they um, emphasize love, they de-emphasize or deny holiness. When you put those two verses together, you find out God is light and God is love. God is holy love. And he is not the schmaltzy, sentimental love of the liberals. It is a holy love. Now, because they, in effect, are defining or re, uh, rejecting or redefining the holiness of God in their overemphasis on love, 
they consequently reject the wrath of God. Very rarely will you hear liberals talk about the wrath of God. If they do, they're usually using it in a little bit different way than we do. Only a few of them, to my knowledge, believe in any kind of wrath of God. They usually grossly redefine it. Usually in such jingoistic terms as, well, the wrath of God is the love of God. And uh, now the grain of truth again in that is, um, as I preached on not too long ago, God loves people. And when His love is spurned, it becomes wrath. That's as far as we can say the grain of truth in this is. But that's not what they mean by that. Another way that they define this wrath of God, you say, but it's all over the Bible. Take, for example, Psalm 711. God is angry with the wicked every day. And they'll, they'll get smug and say, well, of course we know better than that. And they say that that was the, the God of wrath of the Old Testament. These Jewish nomads that didn't know much better, they were superstitious. They heard thunder and lightning and they said, oh, God is angry at us. And they say, well, we know better that thunder and lightning is a meteorological phenomenon. So they say that this God of the Old Testament was thunder and wrath. He was an angry tribal deity. But if you went down to Egypt or up to Greece and other places, you find other tribal deities. I am not kidding. This is what is taught in a lot of the seminaries. And they say that this was the evolution of religion. And that you can't quote these things and say that these are eternal verities about God. That they're still carrying out their nomadic superstition. And you say, well, what do you do with places such in the Psalms? Oh, don't you love the Psalms? They say, oh, we love the Psalms. By the way, let me add this. It's not in my notes. Sometimes they profess to really love the Psalms. And I like to say, have you ever read the Psalms? Some of them have. They've written commentaries on the Hebrew of Psalms. Well, my mind goes back to 1973, I believe it was. There was a young man about my age who was a hippie, but not yet a Christian. And he got in a bad car accident. He had a head-on collision with a garbage truck. I have to grin at that because he was so embarrassed by that. But I went and visited him. He was in a body cast for nine months. And I'd go there and share the gospel because I was a brand new Christian. And I'd bring the Bible. And he says, I don't believe in God. But why, you can go ahead and read the Bible. I said, well, can I read something to you? I, I still remember he said, why don't you read the Psalms? I love the Psalms. They're just so beautiful. I remember thinking, you love the Psalms and you don't believe in God. Have you ever read the Psalms? They're all about God. They're inspired about God. I think that he had somehow had heard Psalm 23 as a boy and thought the Psalms were just nature songs about green pastures and white sheep out there, you know, grazing and drinking the water and the white clouds. And he thought that's what the Psalms were. And when I'd read them to him, you know, God is angry with the wicked every day. Is that in the Psalms? Yeah, that's Psalm 711. But that's kind of a, a microcosm of the liberals. They say, oh, we love the Psalms, but oh, that the rest of it... So you say, how how they explain the Psalms? They say, oh, well, Dave and these other ones, when they called down God's wrath, or they believed in the wrath of God, they'd say things such as, well, this is David projecting his frustration upon God. God is not angry. It was David that was angry. And he is projecting this anger upon God and saying, God's on my side. I'm angry and God's angry too. And they say, but of course, we know it was wrong. David simply lost his temper. And if God... Um, his holy, he doesn't lose his temper. This is some of the shenanigans they play with the Bible and with the um, with God. And then they say, well, there's the Old Testament, a God of wrath, but we believe in the New Testament, God of love. How do we refute this? Very easy. I did a study on this a couple of years ago, preaching on the wrath of God, and one Hebrew scholar that I consulted said, not only are there over 600 references to the wrath of God, there are, over, there are at least 20 Hebrew words for wrath, just like in English, wrath, fury, anger, ire. They said there are 20 different Hebrew words. He says it's in virtually every book of the Old Testament. It's right there. But then they will say, oh, but that's the Old Testament. We believe in the New Testament, God of love. Hold on. There are two words in Greek, at least two come to my mind, for wrath. One means a seething wrath of God under the surface. The other one's explosive volcanic wrath. So those that say, well, the Old Testament is all wrath, no love. New Testament is all love and no wrath. Don't know their Bible. There is wrath and mercy in both Testaments. For example, John 3.36, you know John 3.16, God so loved the world. Last verse of that chapter said, He that does not obey God, the wrath of God abides over him. Jesus Himself spoke about the wrath of God. 
He's not some uh, tribal deity concocted by superstitious Jewish nomads. He's the one true God that is angry every day. And I will add, he is angry at liberals for distorting his truth. They will have to answer to him. Now, what about the Trinity? Fortunately, some liberals at least profess a belief in the Trinity. They may redefine it in various ways, but some are more basically orthodox on the Trinity. Uh, on the other hand, Karl Barth, for example. Other ones out not deny the Trinity. You remember Unitarianism. There is a Unitarian Universalist church today. Their cardinal doctrine is there is only one God. There is no Trinity. Jesus, therefore, is not God. I'm going to say more about that, Lord willing, next week, the deity of Christ. But many of them deny the Trinity. Other ones do not. Now, here's we come to something that I addressed a few weeks ago at our conference. It's become increasingly popular for liberals to feminize God. This goes along with the uh, modern feminist uh, movement. They particularly like to do this with the Holy Spirit. Obviously, they can't get very far saying God the Father is a woman, although they sometimes pray our Mother who art in heaven. I actually heard someone that called himself an evangelical theologian, had a Ph.D. from Harvard, pray our Mother which art in heaven. <clears throat> it turned my stomach to hear that. Usually they don't refer it to God the Father, but the Holy Spirit. They'll say, well, just like the basic family unit is a father, a mother, and a child. They say that's the Trinity. After all, human families should be patterned after God. So it's God the Father, God the Mother, that is the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. They're wrong. They are again borrowing from not only pagan philosophy, but pagan religions. Pagan religions frequently had a mother goddess. You've heard of Isis, Artemis, Venus, Aphrodite. Go around the world. Many pagan religions believe in a mother goddess. But you don't find it in the Bible. You find it in the book of Jeremiah thundering against the idea of the mother goddess. Uh, the father and the son are obviously male. Father, son. Names are personal. Uh, male names, personal pronouns. He, his, him. The same thing with the spirit. He, his, him. Even the word spirit. The spirit is Masculine, male, not female. What's behind this? Some of them will actually come right out and say, if it's Father, Son, and Spirit, there's a patriarchal male God. We hate men. So the driving force of this is to produce a God-goddess in their own image. In other words, a bisexual, androgynous, hermaphrodite God. And since God is like that, what's wrong with homosexuality and lesbianism? And they dare do this with the deity. That is gross blasphemy. Again, you see an illustration. Wrong ethics can be traced back to a wrong view of God. In fact, according to Romans 1, this is why they distort the view of God, is to protect their sins. So God is not a goddess. He is not Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. He is the one true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Enough said on that. Now, another um, view, kind of in the same sort of neighborhood, uh, it goes by the name of the humanity of God. Basically, it's summed up like this. There is no qualitative difference between God and us, so God is basically a big man. Now, some of them say man as in male, but other ones just say God is a big human. Now, this isn't the same thing per se as the Mormon idea. Mormon idea is that um, one of their leaders said, quote, as God is, we now are and uh, we may one day become. God was once a man, became a god. We are now little gods in the process of becoming God. Well, that's a little bit like the liberalism, but basically the liberal idea, some, this liberal idea of the humanity of God is there are no incommunicable attributes of God. They are all communicable. I'll remind you what that means. God has communicable attributes. Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. First uh, Peter chapter 1. Be truthful as I am truthful. Things like that. Those are communicable. Incommunicable would be, for, exa for example, his self-existence, his omniscience, omnipresence, uh, omni omnipotence, his eternality, his infinity, his unchangeableness. We will never become any of these. One form of this humanity of God says there are no incommunicable attributes. They're all communicable. In other words, there is no otherness of God. 
This is very similar to saying we're part of God and we're becoming God. If God is a big man, this theory would say, then man is a little God in embryo. You see how it pieces together? And it's very similar. A lot of the pagans felt, where did their gods come from? They were once humans that climbed Mount Olympus and became gods. So they say those gods are simply big men and women. But, Numbers 23, 19, God himself says, quote, God is not a man. Or as it says in the book of Psalms, God says, you thought I was altogether such a one as yourself. There are some similarities between us and God, and there are some communicable attributes. But there is still much about God that is considerably different than us, this otherness of God. And uh, so God says, you thought I was altogether just like you. You were wrong. Liberals of this stripe would say God is simply a big man. The only difference is he is more of a, man, more of a God than we are. Uh, he's simply bigger, older. He has become in process to be more of this great divine potential. But uh, they are dead wrong. Okay, three more and then we begin to close. Next, they really don't like the reform view of the sovereignty of God. Remember, our Arminians don't like it, but there are evangelical Arminians, but the liberal ones are viciously against the sovereignty of God and that often opens this idea of liberalism, the total rejection of the sovereignty of God. Um, I could give you a historical lesson on this. For example, John Locke, one of the great, uh, or one of the leading deists, was also a political uh, theoretician. He had big influence on the founding of the United States, his idea of the social contract, meaning those that rule only rule at the behest of those that are ruled. And they project this up into the heavens saying God basically has, he's not a king because we don't believe in monarchs. We believe in a democracy. God is a president and that he should reflect our desires. This is the sort of nonsense that came out of that distorted view of freedom and sovereignty. But Romans 11.36 says, From him, through him, and to him are all things. God is regularly called the king, the monarch, even the Greek word despotis, despot, absolute Ruler. The Bible says our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. He is a king. He is sovereign. He reigns. Now, then there's another liberal. You see, the liberals are very clever. If they can't get you with one error on one side of the road, they'll get you on the other side. They swing back and forth from deism to romanticism and so forth. And here's how some of them do it. Instead of believing in the historic reform view of the sovereignty of God, they have a distorted view of the freedom of God they have grossly misinterpreted and overdone the sovereignty of God. They're not hyper-Calvinists, but they believe in an unlimited freedom of God. This was even going on in the Middle Ages with Duns, Scotus, and some others. They basically were saying God is free to do anything He chooses. You say, oh, that's great. That's the sovereignty of God. Now think about it again. Is God free to do anything? Is God free to lie? No. Titus 1, 2, God cannot lie. Can God sin? No. They would suggest God can break His own laws. They'd say all the laws of God flow from His will, and His will is totally arbitrary. God's will is not bound by His nature or His attributes. He has to be totally free. It's an unlimited freedom. Even Karl Barth suggested something like this, that God is free to be His opposite. In the Middle Ages, they suggested things like, well, God can forgive without sacrifice because His laws are, at, are, are arbitrary. He has this unlimited freedom and He doesn't require absolute holiness or absolute sacrifice. Some of you went so far as to say, well, Jesus didn't have to be the sacrifice for our sins. God could, could have sent an animal. Even a pig, they say, would have been sufficient. Or just He, he could have said, well, I forgive them and sweep it all on the carpet. Not at all what the Bible says. The book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Their wrong ideas are rooted in their wrong view of freedom in God. God is free, but His, his will is never freed from His holy attributes. He is one. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, saying that God cannot lie, says God cannot deny Himself. God cannot sin, lie, command sin. He cannot break His own law. God is not free to go against what He is. He is holy. But can you see how the bulls want this? One of their great words is freedom. We want freedom. Now, again, do you see how the Arminian overemphasis on free will can lead to this? 
God, we need to be absolutely free to do whatever we want because they say God is free to do whatever He wants to. They misinterpret the verse that says our God is in the heavens, He does whatever He wants to. And they say, well, God can even change His mind. There are no absolute decrees. God can change His law. Therefore, we can come up with whatever laws we want to because we are in the image of God. There are no absolutes because God is not absolute. It's all a mishmash of a wrong view of the freedom of God and the relationship of His will, attributes, and Perfect nature. Now, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but try to digest it. Okay, lastly, and this has really only come about in recent decades, that they say, well, since there's only one God, but God has many names, and everybody is a, is a child of this one God that's the Father, therefore, God is the same in all religions. We call him Jehovah, they will say. But the Muslims call him Allah. And uh, the Hindus will say there are many gods, but the top god is Brahman. So they say, but it's really all the same god. Now, you've heard this idea. You've heard it on the media. You've heard it at college. And other ones that say there's only one god. Allah is the same as the god of the Bible. And they'll look at you wide eyed like, well, duh, it's so obvious there's only one god. Muslims are worshiping the same gods. And, well, the Buddhists and the Confucianists and the Jains and all these others are worshiping the same God because after all, there is only one God. God's everybody Father. And God's everybody Father. So they said, well, we may have a little bit more refined definition of God, but it's the same God. Most liberals say that the God of the Bible is the same as the God of the Koran. And it comes out when they say things like, well, you know, Islam in Arabic means peace. It comes from the Arabic word Salam, like shalom. And they say, well, you know, there's a lot we can learn from Muslims. Now you know why there's this liberal fascination. Even after 9-11, liberals are fascinated by Islam. Because at root they say they worship the same God. The Bible answer thunders and says they do not worship the same God. Remember I quoted this morning, 1 Corinthians 10-20. The things which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice not to God's, to God, but to demons. Behind the pagan gods are demons. There are many places in the Bible that teach this. You find it in the Psalms. You find it in Deuteronomy, 1 Corinthians 10, even in the book of Revelation. That the gods of the pagans are demons in disguise. Allah is a pagan deity. In fact, uh, uh, Robert Murray and others, uh, even those that don't claim evangelical, will show that, that Allah was a actually a tribal deity of a certain nomadic tribe of Arabs, he was the moon god. That's why the symbol of Islam is a crescent moon that's also a scimitar to cut off the heads of those that won't worship him. They, say he, they said this was the tribal god, and they believed there were many gods, but that was their favorite god. And then one of their leaders got fanatical. His name was Muhammad, Muhammad. And he said, not only is the moon god... The best God, He is the only God. And I am His only prophet. Let's go on the march. And that's how they conquered the Middle East for hundreds of years. But they are worshiping a moon God. Not the one true God. The God of Islam is not the God of the Bible. He is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has different attributes. The God of Islam is not a trinity. Next, they vehemently deny that Allah is a father. I have had Muslims go ballistic on me and almost attack me saying, God is not a father. God has no son. Can't be a father if he doesn't have a son. God has no son. God has no wife. God is not not father. That is far into the Muslim view of Allah. But it is essential to the Bible view of the God and Father, not only of Christ, but of those adopted into His family. God is not everybody's father, but God is the father of Christians. Next, Islam's Allah really doesn't have grace. But the true God is a God of grace, undeserved mercy and forgiveness. I could go on a list like that, but the point should be taken. The God of the Bible is not the God of pagan religions. How can you read the Old Testament in particular, especially the prophets? They went after God, goddesses, all these pagan gods and said they are idols, they are demons. Stay away from them. And here's what the liberals, the liberals are the descendants of the Baal prophets. Their world council of churches could be called the Canaanite council of cults. Well, those are just some of the liberal heresies concerning 
God, let me just make a few concluding comments while you think up some questions. The Bible says God created man in his image, but that image has been soiled by sin. So, what is the root of idolatry? Romans 1 and elsewhere says the root of idolatry is in this wrong view of God. They know that there is a God. They don't like the attributes that God has revealed, so they distort it, and it comes out as idols. In other words, they remake God in their own image. And that's where gods and goddesses have come from. But, since fallen men and women, are, they only have vestiges of the true image of the true God, they have a better image of their father, the devil. That is what sin is, total depravity. We are more in the image and likeness of the devil than we are of the one true God. And so when liberals remake their God in their own image, and their own image is the image of Satan, therefore, this remade God, such as we've seen this evening, bears a closer resemblance to Satan than the one true God. You say, how could it be? Satan is not a God of love. No, but Satan will throw love feelings to people saying there is no holiness, there is no wrath. Of course Satan doesn't believe in the wrath of God. And so one of the key things Satan hates about God is God. He hates the attributes of God and so he promotes idolatry and philosophical and theological blasphemy that distorts the true attributes of God. There is only one true God, but there are many false gods. Idolatry begins by distorting the truth about God, and it begins in the sinful hearts and imaginations of man. And so the gods of liberalism are not the one true God. They are false gods that they concocted in their pretended profundity in their blasphemy. And blasphemy it is, because the term blasphemy means an insult directed against the one true God. Bottom line, you've heard the old phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. God ain't broke. We don't need to fix God. We don't need to realign or redefine His holy attributes. We should accept Him just as He is. Perfect, holy, true, loving, and all these other things. And once we accept it like that, then we can truly worship Him and not distort Him. Well, that's our lesson this evening on the liberal's distortion of God. Pretty deep, but I've tried to simplify it for you tonight. Do we have any questions at the back? Yes, but the question was, uh, what about modalism? Also known as monarchianism, patripassionism, um, oneness. I'm not, I've read very few liberals that would believe in modalism. Um, modalism is usually held by cults. A few cults like the United Pentecostal Church teach that. Apostolic churches. It's the idea that there's not three persons in God, only one. But at least that view believes in the deity of Christ. The historic liberal rejection of the Trinity moves in the other direction of Arianism, like the Jehovah's Witnesses saying there's no Trinity because Jesus isn't God. So, I guess there's probably been some modalists somewhere. The Unitarians are not modalists. Okay? Anyone else? Obviously, when... And remember what I said again. I want to give them their due. Not all liberals believe all of this. In fact, it's impossible to believe all of this because some of them are contradictory errors. Deism and idealism, for example. But you get the general drift. None of the attributes of God are safe from their attack. But as Jonathan Edwards said, the arrows, the arrows of sinful man may be directed at God, but none of them hit him. God sits in the heavens and laughs. CJ, do you have anything on tonight's study? The Muslim view of God, for example, rejects the Trinity. Not just because they reject the deity of Christ, but they emphasize God is one. The carnal um, creed of Islam is there is one God, Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of God. They emphasize one, one, one. Therefore, there's nothing plural about God. They deny, they deny the Trinity. That's probably the key thing. Yeah. 
Well, you read in the Quran as well as in the Hadith, the recurring phrase, um, Muhammad is merciful, Muhammad is merciful. For example, if you were to ask a, a very diligent uh, Muslim, uh, how are you going to make it to paradise because you have sins? And they say, well, Allah is merciful. He'll find a way. That's basically how, what they're trusting in. So they will say Allah is merciful, but they'll say he is merciful to the righteous, not to the unrighteous. That is a concept they can't grasp. How can God, how can Allah be merciful to unrighteous people? Because uh, Allah is, merci- is, is holy. We know the answer to that. It's called grace. Yeah, five carnal things that they do, you know, pray toward uh, Mecca, go on a Hajj, give alms, and believe in Islam. And they hope that one day they'll make it because the Quran says, you know, that Allah has the scales in His hands. If you have more good deeds than bad, He'll accept you. And if you evangelize Him, say, well, what about the bad ones? They say, well, Allah is all knowing and all merciful. He'll find out some way to deal with my bad deeds. But we have the answer. God is loving and He is holy. He can show undeserved mercy without compromising His justice. He punished the Lord Jesus Christ in our place. Therefore, as it says in Romans 3, He can be merciful. He can be just and the justifier of those that believe in Jesus. That is something foreign to Muslims. But as our brother from the Middle East shows, sometimes when they grasp that, they jump at that because they say, oh, we know deep down, Allah has no real mercy. They're drawn to the mercy of Jesus, the kindness that is undeserved. Do we have anything else? Up front here? I know this sounds pretty deep and theological, but it is actually. But I've tried to keep it fairly simple and hit the main points and to refute them. Because you'll come across some of these on the radio, neighborhood, relatives. We Yes. Fallen man would kill God if he could, and that's why they killed Jesus. He, he said, um, I'll read this one. He says, They have no scorn for the attributes of God, particularly the holiness. All wicked men hate the holiness of God. He says, But sometimes wicked men may have a love for some moral virtue out of self love and out of respect for mm-hmm. his of consequence. So, they love his goodness because it gives good gifts. Yeah, they like His goodness because God gives good things. But they don't love God as such. They love His good gifts. And if God stopped giving them good gifts, they'd hate God. I remember when a lady storming out of a church shouted something at the preacher and said, uh, you know, my God is not a God of wrath. My God, you know, doesn't punish people in hell. And the preacher said, you're right, lady. Your God doesn't. But your, your God is the devil. Boy, I'd knock her out of her high heel shoes. My God's the devil. Yes, and you love Him and you worship Him. In fact, He's your Father. Because the only true God is a God of holiness and wrath. And once you've denied that... Remember I said this when D.A. Carson spoke at our conference. I remember saying, how many attributes of God does God allow you to give up and still maintain the one true God? None. But liberals want to pick at them. They're nipping at his heels, as it were. They want to take away transcendence or eminence. His personality, his foreknowledge, uh, his his wrath, and these other things. And they want to pick and pick and pick. But God says, you take me as I am. And a true Christian says, I will take him just as he is. And we rejoice in that. And that's part of worship. Well, suppose we end it there for tonight. And next week, uh, if the Lord wills, we'll be looking at the liberals and their view of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our holy and loving Heavenly Father, we praise You for being just what You are, just what You have done, just what You have said. You are God, and beside You there is none other. And we rejoice in that. 
and we worship you for who you are. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.